All right, welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. And we're in nursing pharmacology, and we are in chapter three. And so we're going to be talking about antimicrobials. So if you look at the chapters, uh, it's going to be antimicrobials introduction, basics, considerations, nursing process, penicillins. And we're going to be going over a number of the critical thinking activities. Again, when I talk about mnemonics, they're either going to be coming from the Memorizing Pharmacology mnemonics book or Memorizing Pharmacology book. Uh, and then there's the giant one, uh, Memorizing Pharmacology Questions, Answers, and Rationales, which is 18 hours. But uh, these two are seven hours each uh, or eight hours each where uh, you can kind of spend a weekend listening to it, really catch up on pharmacology. But I may, may mention some of the mnemonics in there to help you remember and to help you uh, succeed with uh, some of these uh, antimicrobial classes. Okay. All right, we're going to start with the critical thinking question in uh, number 3.2. Okay. So critical thinking activity 3.2, reflecting on current healthcare challenges regarding the ongoing emergence of antimicrobial resistant organisms. Uh, what actions could you take within your nursing practice to help prevent drug resistance? And so the big thing with, with drug resistance is taking the full course of medication. And uh, everybody knows about having medicine left in your medicine cabinet where maybe you took three or four days of medicine and you started to feel better. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, well, why am I taking this medicine? I feel better. I gotten better. Maybe the medicine wasn't, I didn't even need the medicine. Maybe I just, you know, my, my body f fixed it and all is well. Well, what happened was is that the antibiotics kind of came on your team and you were able to wipe up, wipe out enough antibiotics that your immune system was able to take over. But if you don't take the full course of medication, uh, you could have a super infection where you have an infection and it wasn't quite wiped out and it comes back because all of a sudden your teammate is gone that antibiotic so if it's 10 day course you want to finish all 10 days if it's 14 day course uh, you want to finish all 14 days uh, this is especially important uh, with something like uh, tb medicines and the reason we would have like a direct observed therapy or directly observed therapy, DOT, where we watch the patient take the medication is because these aren't something that you take for a few days or 10 days or 14 days. These can be for six months or a year. And the devastation comes from that resistance that if you don't continue the course through the whole thing, then that will come back. And the reason TB is so hard to, to kill is that uh, many of the medications only work with when the, the TB you know, becomes active uh, and then you, know, you wipe it out uh, as it kind of comes out of its shell is maybe a, a better way to, to say that. So uh, again, uh, the big thing that you want to make sure that you do is in, make sure that the patient finishes their medication course uh, and has uh, habits that can help them. And there's a really great book that Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg, he's a Stanford researcher, if I remember right, uh, that you pair the habit of taking the medication with another habit. I remember my uh, grandmother and grandfather did this unintentionally. They didn't listen to read B.J. Fogg. Uh, this was before uh, he wrote the book. But what she would do is uh, it was a hyper antihypertensive medication she would put it on his spoon before he had the morning cereal and he always ate cereal in the morning so the moment before the cereal's there there's a drink there you can uh, take uh, the medication uh, and then be done with it and it wasn't one of those that was without food but that was one way to help so again uh, what you want to do in your practice is to make sure that the patient has not only the, the ability to take the medication, uh, but what is the trigger, the reminder uh, that helps them do that. Okay. All right, let's look at the, the next section. Uh, we're going to look at a case with penicillin. 
Let's read the case first and we'll go from there. So critical thinking activity 3.5a. Using the grid information, considering the following clinical scenario question. Mr. Jones was admitted to the medical surgical floor with a pneumococcal respiratory infection and prescribed penicillin V 500 milligrams PO, which is per os or by mouth. Uh, many people say per oral, uh, but it really is per os, uh, per opening in Latin. Uh, every six hours, you bring the patient his 0800 medications, which includes penicillin. The patient just finished his breakfast with, that included orange juice. Would you proceed with the penicillin administration at this time? Why or why not? And let's look at the uh, considerations. Okay. And when we look at administration considerations, we see, okay, check for allergies, and that's already been done. Obtain a culture if ordered before the first dose. Make sure we're taking care of the right uh, bacteria. Take with a full glass of water. Okay, no acidic juice. All right, that might be a problem. Best absorbed orally on an empty stomach. Give with food if stomach upset. If high doses, monitor INR, platelets, PT. So, so before we kind of move on, let's make sure that we know what these uh, mean. So INR is international normalized ratio, uh, and PT is prothrombin time. And what we're really doing is we're we're saying okay when uh, we're worried about uh, and things like warfarin. Uh, make sure that you know, we're not causing the patient to bleed or something like that. So this is um, kind of a, a good way of um, introducing how to read some of these charts and how some of them are not really the way that you want them. You don't really want to combine penicillin V, PO, penicillin GIV, amoxicillin. Uh, these are really three different products. And you really should look out one product at a time. Uh, with penicillin V, although it's true that with some penicillins you would not want to have an acidic juice, and it's good that you know you would want to separate by four hours. Uh, in this case, it probably would be okay. It wouldn't really interact with them. Uh, but um, and you can kind of go to the um, one one of the places I like to go is uh, the Mayo Clinic. And you can kind of see, okay, well, here we go. We've got amoxicillin, penicillin V, and they've grouped them in this way. And then penicillin G is in a different spot and saying, do not drink acidic you know, fruit juices, orange and grapefruit juice uh, within one hour of taking penicillin G. Because penicillin G, it, the acidic environment of the stomach, the acidic environment of the fruit juice, uh, significant effect on penicillin G, but we're talking about penicillin V, uh, so that should not, uh, again, be an issue. All right, let's kind of move on to cephalosporins, uh, which, and sometimes uh, we see that there's going to be uh, some overlap between penicillins and cephalosporins. Okay, well, let's start with the case, critical thinking activity 3.6a. Uh, using the above grade information, consider the following clinical scenario question. Ms. Jenkins is an 89-year-old patient admitted to the med surge floor for treatment of skin infection. The admitting pres provider prescribes cefazolin one gram every eight hours IV. And so how do we know this is a cephalosporin? So we see the ceph, C-E-F prefix. Uh, the older one was C-E-P-H, but they've changed that since to C-E-F. And so anytime you see that ceph, uh, and we'll see that in the medications up here, where you have cephalexin, C-E-P-H, Ceph, C-E-F, Ceph Brazil, second generation, Ceph Triaxone, third generation, Cephapine, fourth generation, and Ceph Tolazone, Tolazane, Ceph Tolazane uh, is going to be uh, fifth generation. All right, and then the Memorizing Pharmacology, the original book, I, I talk a little bit about uh, these prefixes and ways to remember them. For example, the tri in Ceph Triaxone is in good way to remember third generation. That is, just as there's three wheels on a tricycle, you can remember that tri, or three points in a triangle, uh, that's how you can remember that's third generation. And um, Ceph, I talk about how it has to kind of do with your head, and you only have one head, so that's first generation, and so forth. But I don't want to get in the weeds with that. Uh, what I do want to do, though, is, is note that there's going to be an issue with dose adjustment if there's renal impairment. And so as we read the rest of the case, we're going to see, you know, kind of what's going on with that. 
So Mrs. Jenkins' administration laboratory tests include renal laboratory studies reflecting creatinine, 1.3 milligrams per deciliter, normally 1.2, blood urea nitrogen, 25, and now normal is 8 to 20, glomerular filtration rate, 55 milliliters per minute, normally 90 to 120 milliliters per minute. On day three, Mrs. Jenkins has renal laboratory studies performed again. And so we see that the creatinine has gone up to 1.6 milligrams per deciliter. We see the blood urea nitrogen, BUN, is 57 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, this is a significant increase from 25. And we see the glomerular filtration rate uh, has gone down from 55 milliliters per minute. Uh, so our day three finding is expected or not. What course of action should the nurse take? And so we're not doing any calculations here. We're just kind of acknowledging that, okay, there's going to be dosage adjustment if there's renal impairment. We have uh, cefazolin as our medication. And yeah, we're seeing that uh, the kidney function, uh, there's an issue. And then we're going to probably make a dosage adjustment. Okay. All right, so we are at critical thinking activity 3.7a. Uh, using the above grid information, consider the following clinical scenario question. John Smith was admitted to the hospital with serious abdominal infection. Nurse notices that the patient is allergic to penicillin. As he prepares to administer the first dose of imipenem medication, what is the nurse's next best action? So we go up here and we see that um, with imipenem we should be checking for allergies, including penicillin and cephalosporins. And so the first thing that we're really thinking about here is, okay, let's check the medical record. Let's make sure that there are no uh, allergies. Let's make sure that uh, there is no allergy to penicillin. Um, and if that's the case, uh, then we should be okay. Uh, but there is a cross sensitivity, uh, you know, the data show that it's usually less than you know, a percent. Uh, it can go anywhere different from, you know, a third of a percent to almost four percent. But generally, cross sensitivity um, is going to be uh, less than one percent. But again, we still want to make sure, you know, if the patient has a positive penicillin skin test or something like that, uh, that we're not uh, giving this medication if they do have an allergy to penicillin. Okay, let's move on to the next one, critical thinking activity 3.8a, using the grid information above, consider the clinical scenario question. A patient with cystic fibrosis is diagnosed with ventilator-associated pneumonia and is prescribed acetrianam, one gram IV daily for a suspected pseudomonas aeruginosa infection. The nurse reviews the culture results that just arrived and notices that the results indicate the infection is caused by methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, uh, will this medication be effective against this bacteria? What's the nurse's next best response? Well, here's a point where we're really um, maybe doing the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, so something like a monobactam, like Astrianam, uh, you know, that's fine when you have something gram-negative like Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, but uh, when you're talking about uh, MRSA, the MRSA is gram positive, and uh, it's not likely that there's going to be MRSA coverage, and uh, we really may just be prescribing the wrong thing. So I uh, really want to talk to the prescriber, uh, s mention the, the new culture report, and then uh, you know make a decision on uh, what to do next. But uh, really, this is a case where we're saying we're, we're giving the wrong medication. Uh, because the uh, culture does not match uh, the antibiotic that's being given. All right, critical thinking activity 3.9a is using the grid information considering the following clinical scenario question. A nurse is caring for an elderly diabetic patient who's been prescribed trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for a UTI, urinary tract infection. What nursing interventions would be implemented prior to medication administration? So we're kind of given, we have a diabetic um, we have Bactrim or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Uh, what's the issue? And so as we look at sulfonamides, and you can see, again, here are the kind of memorizing pharmacology um, prefixes. In this case, you have sulfa, okay? And then that prim <clears throat> is also uh, a, uh, a suffix that we can use. Okay, and, and so if we have a sulfa, 
drug, our, our big concern here is that we have to be cautious with oral anti-diabetics. And then it's it might increase, and this is a weird thing to say, increase hypoglycemia. So we're going to you know, make the chances of this patient's uh, blood sugar being too low uh, higher. It's a little bit weird to say low, high like that. And then monitor the glucose level carefully. So that's kind of the, the first thing. And then there's a couple of other issues. Make sure that there's a you know, dosage adjustment if we have some kind of renal impairment. Uh, we want to make sure that you know, we're, we're giving the right amount of medication. And so what you can do is to just kind of see like where you are with uh, interactions. <clears throat> you can put in, inter, uh, take like a drug interactions checker and put in sulfamethoxazole and put in something like glucophage, uh, which is metformin, and see what happens. And you're going to find that there's going to be an increase in that uh, glucophage level. Uh, and then there's also a concern when we have uh, something like um, when we have something like uh, renal uh, issues as well. So when you're kind of doing this to make it tangible, rather than just saying, okay, diabetic, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, I get it, uh, to actually take a minute, maybe try a drug interactions checker or something like that as a way to kind of solidify it in your brain that uh, there is that interaction. Okay, and here's our uh, last critical thinking activity. We're going to break this section into to two episodes because uh, we're right at the you know, 20 minute mark. But critical thinking activity 3.10a, uh, utilize, utilizing the above grid information, consider the following clinical scenario question. A nurse has administered levofloxacin. So we look at this ending and we see floxacin. So the oxacin says that it's a quinolone. The FL infix. Uh, really helps us know that it is now a fluoroquinolone, so like ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin, uh, to a patient diagnosed with pneumonia. The patient reports that he has pain above his heel today. Okay. The nurse assesses and discovers the pain is over the Achilles tendon. What is the nurse's next best response? Uh, this is one of those ones where you really, really um, want to notify the provider. Uh, tendon pain um, anything tendon uh, is going to be a real, real red flag uh, with fluoroquinolones. Um, and when we look at the, the chart above, okay, uh, we're going to see adverse effects discontinue immediately if tendonitis, tendon rupture, peripheral neuropathy, CNS effects, or muscle weakness in patients with myasthenia gravis. And we see this uh, tendonitis and tendon rupture uh, that we're really concerned about with the fluoroquinolones. Okay. But again, coming to the very beginning of it, we always hear about, okay, well, we need to, to do things so that we have good critical thinking, but you still have to memorize some things, which is to identify this drug as a fluoroquinolone. And you do that with the oxygen ending for the quinolone and then the FL to make it a fluoroquinolone. So I think that it's not just you know, critical thinking, but also uh, that memorizing component with it. Okay. So if you do want to kind of uh, get that, uh, I have a cheat sheet for you. Uh, you just go to memorizingfarm.com and you can just scroll down to any, most any of the pages uh, and you can get the, the cheat sheet from the Memorizing Pharmacology book if you want. Uh, if you just want to kind of look at some of those endings, uh, I have a couple of them here. You can go to memorizingfarm.com, and I apologize for how long this is, but forward slash drug hyphen prefixes hyphen and hyphen suffixes. Uh, and that's the that's the smaller one. That's the 200. And, uh, you'll notice that although there were 200 drugs, there's not 200 endings here. And the reason for that uh, is that because you have similar endings with multiple drugs, you don't have to memorize that many. But for example, we were uh, in here in the immune section, and we see that uh, the drugs we talked about, psyllin for penicillins, okay, ceph for cephalosporins, uh, sulfa uh, for sulfonamides, okay, prim for trimethoprim type antimicrobials. 
uh, and so forth. So uh, if you just want a quick uh, you know, page that has a number of those, uh, you can find it here. If you want the big one, I mean, this is a huge one, 60 page drug list of drug prefixes and suffixes, uh, that is at memorizingfarm.com forward slash drug suffix PDF. And there is the PDF of the 60, it's 60 pages long, it's almost 900 drugs. Uh, you can find it there. Uh, but again, if you really want to get these down and uh, take the time to, to listen to the Memorizing Pharmacology Relaxed Approach book, it what it does is it breaks it down by drug class. So you can go into the antibiotics, get those memorized so that when you see these case studies, uh, it's a lot easier to kind of put everything together. Okay. And if you've never had an Audible book before, they're free. They always give you that first book free. So I'll put those links in the show notes. Uh, but again, hopefully these cases were helpful to kind of get your thinking going, uh, marrying that memorization piece uh, with the critical thinking piece.